the dreamers believe us now. Sunday morning will drive to Surfing has been around for hundreds of years, and today it is one of the most distinct parts of Southern Californian culture. But while the fast-growing sport draws over 23 million people to the coasts each year, few participants know how these boards ever come to be, and the process used by the few masters of the board-making craft still alive today. This is the story of one of the masters of the craft, the story of a surfboard shaper. But before we can see the finished product, we have to go back to the first element of a board, back to the foam. Um, I grew up in Hermosa Beach and there was four surfboard factories in Hermosa and this was 68, 69 when I was 8th grade. When I'd walk home from school, we'd walk by and see the Bing factory which was next to the fire department and next to the Bing factory was body glove wetsuits. So we'd dig in their trash and get wetsuit things and go home and try to make like gloves put your hands in it was free. So meanwhile, when we were there at the body glove factory, we could see Bing's guys and the door would be open and we'd look in the door, you know, and they'd have scraps of cloth in the trash. And so we'd go and we'd dig the trash and grab what we wanted. Then I started making skateboards out of foam and fiberglass because they were so small. And then next thing I know, I started going to the factory down farther that had Greg Knoll there and they had drums of resin that had like a gallon of resin on the bottom of the drums. So I'd go on my bicycle and had a steel funnel and a steel gallon can and I'd pour the, the leftovers that was just sitting out there and, and bring it home. And then I went to Greg Knoll and bought a blank. So I was 16 years old. But that's when I started, you know, building surfboards in my garage. And all through high school, there was one other guy and myself that were the only surfboard makers in high school. So he had one group of people he made boards for, and then I had another group. And most of my friends all had to work at like McDonald's for jobs, and I was able to uh, build surfboards to make money. Back when I was in high school, uh, the biggest obstacle was learning how to be professional without working in a shop. Those guys had trade secrets. And so when I first got the job offer, and Phil Becker got me my job at Rick Surfboards, he saw a couple of boards I'd done outside glassing for, and he asked me to bring one by. I brought one by, he looked at it, and then he called Rick Stoner in to check out what he saw. And Rick took me in the back there, and he gave me a job foiling fins. I was so surprised and so happy to be able to do that, because, uh, that opportunity was just not given out, you know? And then so much went on where, you know, I got more involved in a company that was very competitive and we were making boards for Japan in the late 70s, early 80s. And then it seemed like the surfboard business kind of went flat. The last, I'd say, maybe 15 years, because I was out of it for a few years and I got back into it. And I didn't realize when I got back into it how much China had a big influence in the surfboard industry. Almost all boards were being made in China with the ones that are still made here in California. But it was kind of uh, disheartening because sometimes I'd see the boards that were from China and I'd go, wow, these look pretty good. It, it's made a lot of people that were in the surfboard business for a living get out of it and go do other things. So when I got back into it, um, the economy was bad, you know, 2007. And so that's what I've been fighting. And the last, last three or four years now has really picked up. 
but I'm not able to find guys that know how to build surfboards that want to do it because they've had to go on and, and make a living doing something else. So I've had to bring in a bunch of novices and, and show them what I know. And that's been a long road, but it's about the only way you can do it. And I can't do all the work myself now that we're doing over a certain amount. I've had to hire people. Uh, well, my name is Natasha Holmstrom. Primarily, I work in the factory as uh, ding repair. I do most of the ding repair here, and then a few odds and ends around the shop, whatever Ray needs done. And then I've also um, created my own label, Holmstrom Surfboards. So my boards are getting out there in the water, which are really nice. I apprenticed with a shaper in Santa Barbara for five months, and it, it wasn't a paid position, it was strictly an apprenticeship. I called uh, Wayne Rich, who's a, a very famous shaper, asking if I could apprentice with him. He didn't have anything, but he directed me to Back Nine Surf Factory, Ray Lukey. So I got in contact with Ray. He said, come on in, we need help with repair. Since then, I've moved up here just so I could be closer to work. So yeah, I'm here seven days a week. I can't get enough of the shop. Uh, Ray Lukey's a mentor of mine. He's taught me a lot. And uh, I'm just really fortunate to be able to work in this factory with the people that I do. After stepping away from the surfboard business uh, for as long as I did, and then coming back to it, it was already starting to go this way. In 1991 is when I got out of it. And I noticed that the longboard resurgence was coming back, but slowly, you know? And through that period of time, you know, it's, it's picked up. I mean, there's a whole grouping of people that are surfing traditional old style surfing, which everybody kind of thumbed their nose at before. And now it's, all the old traditional stuff is is there and people are trying to do it, you know, uh, which is really great. But I just think there's a certain commercialism and I don't think any industry is able to have it not happen, but, uh, you know, like the ski industry or motorcycle riding or whatever, it's just evolved into this huge mega clothing kind of business which was already there, but now it's probably because the internet has helped promote that. And my belief is that with uh, China, the retailers wanted to start making as much profit on surfboards as they were on a t-shirt. Well, if they buy some for five bucks, they want to sell it for 10. Well, the surfboard industry had never been that way. You would build a surfboard and be $300 and a retailer might sell it for $400. So there wasn't a lot of markup, maybe 20%. And I think some of the retailers that maybe were more clothing stores were angry about it. And I think that helped spur part of it. Um, but I, you know, that's my belief. I don't think everybody feels that way, but that's the way I feel. But bottom line is the whole hand-built surfboard thing is coming back to California. Uh, I teach people how to shape surfboards and I'm doing it to keep the whole soul of surfboard building alive. Other than that, I think it was gonna die if, you know, but now the Chinese market has tapered off to where people are going and buying a blank and trying to shape their own board. And uh, I don't think it's gonna hurt the surfboard industry. I think it's only gonna help it and it's gonna tie everybody back together.